साइन बाय वालेकुम सलाम अस्सलाम वालेकुम हाय एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस ओके uh wait i think wait uh, we should wait uh, for 5 minutes yeah sure sure so that more more people can join yeah yeah absolutely Rimli, can you mute your? Yeah, okay, fine. हेलो हाँ भलो आटिंग मीटिंग आबान के देखा साइन भाई नमस्कार तो जस्ट अनम्यूट योर माइक माइक्रोफोन हेलो आ साइन भाई जस्ट वी कैन स्टार्ट नाउ यस यस आई थिंक वी कैन स्टार्ट नाउ गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी माय सेल्फ साइन शेट ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ बेस बेंगल एकेडमी ऑफ फॉर सोशल एम्पावरमेंट I am here. We to, can't see you. I am here to welcome all the participants to base online lecture series number six. Our uh, today's topic is uh, 
this is not basically this is not a lecture series lecture it is actually a conversation between mamadul hasan dhabar a phd scholar in university of kolani and dr musarraf hosen khan phd new york university usa now he is working as assistant professor in op jindal global university and uh, i would like to mention some point before we start the conversation uh, i have shared the instruction for attending the base lecture all the participants are requested to go through the instruction uh, so that we can conduct the lecture in a smooth way uh, hasan bhai now over to you <clears throat> good evening uh, and a very warm welcome to another session of our ongoing base online lecture series today we are joined by an eminent academician someone that i took uh, someone that i look up uh, for his range of reading important there yeah, i do and also for his wonderful command over the language in which he articulates his thought is dr mosharraf hosen khan who is presently working as an assistant professor op jindal university haryana he has completed his post graduation in english literature from the university of hyderabad he has done his doctoral coursework from the university of british columbia canada and uh, completed his doctoral degree from new york university usa dr khan is a widely published author he has published many articles in various journal of national and international repute he is the founder and editor of cafe dissenser journal he is recently editing a book on bengali muslim dr khan it is an absolute privilege to have you on base online lecture series thank you very much for joining me on this conversation thank you very much mr dhabak and first of all i should apologize for the glitch yesterday it was not in my hand somehow you know i was we were planning to have it but then my university informed that we'll have an internet downtime in my apartment so i just couldn't do anything about it so i'm really sorry about this to all the participants who expected this to happen yesterday and i would like to thank also base i'll come to it at the end as well for organizing this wonderful lecture series and i'm really grateful that i've been invited to talk today to discuss uh, today and also mr dhawak i'm thankful to you to uh, to agree to be my discussion so thank you very much uh yes uh now dr khan first of all i would uh, request you to share about your research work <clears throat> okay so should i say a bit about myself as well uh yes my... yes of course because okay. it's uh, almost incomplete now yeah because uh, you know it's also a kind of way to getting to know everyone here because many people most people would not know me of course so i come from a place called uh, kotalpur or kotulpur this is in bakura district which is bordering hugli uh, so it's more or less like hugli less bakura because bakura is quite far though the district is bakura so i come from there i did my primary schooling over there and then in my 6th standard i was sent off to a boarding school uh, on the suburbs of calcutta i studied in rahola ramkrishna mission school uh, till my 10th and then i was uh, i studied for 2 years in uttarpara which is again another suburb of calcutta and thereafter i came back after my plus 2 my father brought me back home because he thought in bangla what we call bokhe jawa he thought i I'm sort of, you know, I'm not studying anymore, and it's time to bring me back home so that he can have a better control over me. So, 
that's how i came back home and i i then i started studying in a very small rural college called kamarpukur college which is very near to my house actually it also happens to be the birthplace of ramkrishna dev uh, who in whose school i studied my 10th so i came back i joined the college and during those 3 years if i can get into this you know a slightly lengthy kind of exposition during those 3 years i studied english honors at the same time i was helping my dad in his small business he has a small business because uh, you know i come from a family where education is very instrumental in the sense that if your you know father sees a promise only then he he's going to let you study otherwise it's like why don't you join business why don't you do something you know that can fetch a livelihood what if you don't get a job after your education after your studies so that's how i i i was in business for 3 years so i was doing english honors in college and at the same time i was doing business with my dad you know it's a small place a small business and i was thinking in my mind all this while when i was you know uh, studying and was in business that probably this is not my cup of tea because my dad thought gradually i'll get used to the business and maybe i'll you know i'll have a degree for the sake of having a degree but basically i'll i'll be in business i'll carry on his tradition but it so happened uh, i started doing really well in my undergraduate english honors uh, even though i was in business <laughs> and by the time the third year came it was a three year degree program those days first part one and part two and by the time i wrote my part two i also you know happened to top the university in honors and then i told my dad i am not going to be in this business anymore he was of course not very happy about it but he had no other option he had to allow me to go to study and that's how i ended up in uh, in bardhaman university initially for my masters and then i wrote the test for hyderabad and then i moved to hyderabad so i'm not getting into the detail of it it's a long journey you know from there i went to delhi iit for a phd which i dropped out of after one and a half years i didn't continue because i thought i was going nowhere i was too young at the time right after my masters i just thought you know i was i was not sure what i was doing then i uh, appeared for csc i got a job and they sent me off all the way to darjeeling nowhere like you know calcutta or nearby areas so i was working in Cal- in darjeeling in kershaw college for five and a half years and then i started thinking i'm simply rotting here in the sense that there's been no growth there's no intellectual conversation happening there and i you know i always had this hunger that i should do something uh, intellectually stimulating so then i thought maybe i should you know apply for a phd and then i didn't see any more you know uh, i didn't see uh, any point in applying for a phd in india again the delhi one i had dropped out from delhi iit so this time i thought let me go and do a phd from abroad so first i went to canada to the university of british columbia and i was there for one and a half years i did my co- i completed my coursework phd coursework but i was not very happy because the teacher I, i wanted to work with at the time professor jisha menon uh, she is an india specialist who did a phd from stanford and it so happened she gave birth to a child and she was spending time in stanford with her husband and she was detected with breast cancer and she was no way going to come back to university of british columbia so i thought the department gave me an option that you can work with someone else and i thought this is not what i want to do this is not why i left my secure job in india you know to come to do a phd I, if i want to do a phd i want to do with a specialist in my area of research and that's how i left i applied to american universities and i ended up in a new york university and that's how we, and i got to work with a person i really admire professor robert young and also there was professor rajeshwari sundararajan as well as there is a the you know tons of people in who specialize in south asia like arjuna padurai uh, to many many specialists uh, david laden historian david laden there's so many of them uh, so that's how i ended up in in the us so now coming back sorry i've taken a long time to kind of unwrap it uh, now to come back to the question of my research uh, 
I always wanted to work with on South Asian literature. Uh, so what I did, I chose for my research. When I went to Canada, by the way, I had a di different research area of interest. I had gone to Canada with uh, partition literature as my area of research. And that too, not in English, partition literature in Bangla, because I was very keen on working on Bangla partition literature because I thought no one has done uh, much work on that. Till when I went to Canada in 2007, I worked from 2002 to 2007 of uh, August. When I went to Canada in 2000 September, uh, 2007 September, by that time, if I remember right, I had gone and you know done extensive research in Jadavpur University Library. I had seen only two research theses on Bangla partition literature, one on short story and one on novel. Uh, the short story one was done by one Bangladeshi researcher who was work, uh, who did a research in Jadavpur. So that appealed to me because I was reading a lot of Bangla partition literature actually at the time. But when I moved to the US, I gradually realized that this academia is not very friendly to Bangla literature as such. You know, I had, I had to mainstream my research a little bit more. And that's why I started working on Anglophone South Asian literature, English literature in, on South Asia. So I didn't restrict myself to India. I, I was working on literature from Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Now, coming to the area of research, what I exactly did there. See, uh, the way Muslim subjectivity has always been uh, written on or researched is from a very binary perspective of religious Muslim and secular Muslim. I can give an example. Uh, you know, if you look at the work of someone like Amir Mufti, who wrote a book called Enlightenment in the Colony, he wrote on some of the Indian authors like uh, Manto, Faiza Bent Faiz, Maulana Abdul Kalam Ajad. So he wrote on these writers in, and he showed how in their writing we see the emergence of a secular Muslim subjectivity. Around the same time, uh, Sabah Mahmood was also working on her book. And she wrote this very famous, which became very famous actually, book called The Politics of Piety. It's on Egyptian middle class Muslim women and their piety, their religious subjectivity. And this created a kind of binary in the whole North American academy between Muslim subject, subjectivity and secular subjectivity. So because Amir Mufti was Edward Said's student and he has always this, you know, this fascination for secular subjectivity and secular thinking and that kind of, you know, the, the kind of thinking that comes from Edward Said all the way. But, <coughs> sorry. Sabah Mahmood was coming from another line of thinking. Sabah Mahmood was very influenced by Talal Asad's kind of exploration of Muslim ideas, Muslim subjectivity, anthropology of Islam. So she was coming from that school of thinking. And the academy was very much divided. I attended quite a few talks at that time, I remember. In fact, Amir Mufti came to NYU when I was there. I was doing my PhD. And it created a binary. And I see the kind of animosity, bitterness about you know, each other. Like Amir Mufti would totally dismiss Sabah Mahmood's work. And of course, Sabah Mahmood would say that this is like a sellout kind of work. Uh, Amir Mufti's kind of work is very Western, secular, sellout kind of work. It doesn't really reflect the Muslim reality at all. So I came into this debate when I started my PhD, because around that time, this debate was happening. And I thought Muslim subjectivity is much more complex than being simply religious or secular. So I wanted to deconstruct this binary of religious Muslim and secular Muslim in my own work. So I chose some fiction from South Asia. And I also deployed the theoretical framework of the ordinary and everyday life in my work. And I was trying to argue how if you look at Muslim life through the lens of the everyday, you will see that Muslim subjectivity is neither religious nor secular. It's much more entangled, much more discontinuous, much more inconsistent. You know, one could be a religious Muslim, but one could have various secular yearnings for that matter because of consumer culture within which we... That is your, your, that is your talking worldly subjectivity. Exactly. And I came up with this whole, you know, uh, this, uh, you can say, conceptual category called worldly subjectivity, because I wanted to see Muslim life through this conceptual category called worldly subjectivity. I didn't call it secular subjectivity deliberately. 
So what I said, my argument was kind of, if you look at Muslim writing from South Asia, through the lens of the everyday, what you get is neither religious Muslim nor secular Muslim, but a worldly Muslim. A Muslim who could be Muslim in the religious sense, yet who can have many worldly yearnings. For example, you know, I was reading a lot of Pakistani fiction at the time. And I found Pakistani fiction deals with a lot of subjects like extramarital love, premarital sex, and stuff like that. I started wondering why this is so. And then it, it appeared to me love, love as a worldly category, love as a category of worldly desire, you know, is something that even a religious Muslim can go through, that kind of a desire, right? So it is not restricted that only secular Muslims fall in love before marriage or have sex before marriage. It can happen to a very, very religious Muslim. So I have examples. I'm not getting into that. You know, I, I was reading a lot of these fictions from, uh, from Pakistan. And at the same time, I came across some other work which are trying to complicate this, you know, works like Sirin, Shirin Razak, an Egyptian anthropologist who was talking about desiring subjects, that we could be Muslims, but we have desires. She was mostly looking at, uh, looking at it through a feminist perspective, and she was saying, she was looking at an Islamic movement in, uh, sorry, someone is sharing the screen, but that's okay. Let's continue. Sorry for the interruption. So I was looking at, you know, uh, works like uh, Shirin Razak's work who was looking at the concept of desiring subject. That is how Muslim women in a particular Islamic movement called Al-Hilal in Egypt, in Cairo especially, they were still desiring to do something with their life. And those desires were not just religious desires, mind you. They were like, they wanted to attain higher education. They wanted to work in corporate offices, modern corporate offices. Yet, they're very committed to the Islamic identity. So that's the kind of desiring subject I was also trying to think through in my work. And then I came across works like Lara Deb's work on Lebanese Muslims in Lebanon. Uh, in, uh, in, you know, she talks about the enchanted moderns, which is the idea that one could be modern, yet one could be enchanted, that is religious, religiously enchanted. And then the work like someone like Nilufar Gole, who is a Turkish sociologist, but who lives in France. You know, she gave this a whole idea of the forbidden modern. Again, the notion is that one could be modern, yet one could yearn for things which are kind of forbidden, you know, through, uh, uh, through consumerism, through desire for things which are sometimes forbidden by your religion. So this influenced me in conceptualizing my own category called worldly subjectivity. Right, so that's what I looked at in my research work. Sorry for taking so much. Uh, uh, no, it's okay. Uh, uh, very interesting. And uh, now uh, I want to just ask you that another question: that uh, what do you mean by political Islam that you uh, that you mention in your thesis? Uh, you know. If I have to give a kind of you know, vulgar understanding of the term, of course, we, we can say that any movement that tries to politicize Islam, right? So that could be called political Islam. But I was not actually looking at, that is the thing, I was not looking at the, I was engaging with the idea of political Islam, yet I was not exactly working on the notion of political Islam. So let, you know, in Islam, the idea of political Islam is very contested. That's because... If we go back to the Prophet's time, and if we see uh, from the very beginning in Medina when he was setting up this whole, you know, uh, not a kingdom exactly, uh, his area of control, and he was launching these attacks against Mecca quite a few times. Uh, the whole idea of fighting a war on the basis of religious piety, on the basis of, you know, uh, uh, certain ideas of uh, religious purity is something that has stayed with Islam for since Prophet's time. So when today Imran Khan talks about, you know, creating Pakistan in the model of Medina, Prophet's Medina, I, we, we can see that whole idea of political Islam, uh, you know, in, in some senses. Yet political Islam, if you, if you read, I'll give you more example. If you read you know, someone like W.W. W. Hunter's book called The Indian Muslims. He has a whole chapter on Bengali Muslims going to fight 
on behalf of Saeed Ahmed, who was the Wahhabi uh, preacher in India, in fact, who went to Hajj in Saudi. He came back a converted man. He was, you know, under the, he interacted with uh, Wahhab and he was influenced by ideology. He came back to India and he said that India is uh, Darul Harb, it's not Darul Islam. And it's a, it's a land of infidels and our religious duty is to fight or struggle against this regime. So he went off, uh, Saeed Ahmed went off to the mountains of what today is Afghanistan. You know, in that mountainous region, he started building an army for fighting against the British. And W.W. Hunter writes about a lot of these Bengali Muslims. You know, it's very surprising that from all the way from the Bengal Delta, hundreds of Bengali men who are never known as a martial race anyways. You know, these are not like the Pashtuns or the Punjabis on the other side who are known traditionally as the martial people. So these Bengalis were going in hordes. They were being recruited and sent off all the way to the northwest frontier to join Saeed Ahmed's group to fight the British. You know, that army, he was there building an army to fight the British. So this is also an example of what we can call, you know, uh, what we call today political Islam. Yet, as we know, traditionally, Islam doesn't really differentiate between uh, any aspects of life. So there's nothing called political Islam in that sense. Because Islam is an all, in, all in, encompassing philosophy of life, right? There's no secular and religious division as I, as Talal Asad has written already in his studies. That's because it encompasses all aspects of life. That's why sometimes when we differentiate between the secular and the religious in Islam, many people, many have asked me, how do you differentiate? Because Islam doesn't make a distinction of that kind at all. Everything is religious in one sense. Everything is Islamic. There's no division between, you know, uh, between a secular and a religious uh, division. Yet, what we are seeing, you know, with colonialism, uh, I don't know why so many of them are sharing their screens. Oh, anyways, so what we what we what we see with uh, colonialism, especially, we see a rupture with that notion of, you know, uh, Islam as an all encompassing philosophy of life. What we see, because under the duress of Western influence, we see the state has become secular, you know, and that's why, because the state identifies itself as a secular state, whether it's Egypt or even in, you know, in Syria or even in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, the state was very secular or in Pakistan. Pakistan could be a religious country, but the state is very secular. As a result, as a you know, reaction to this kind of state-imposed secularism, what we have in contemporary times is a kind of movement, whether you take Jamaat Dawa, Jamaat Islami, or any of these movements uh, across the globe, you know, in different parts of the world, what we have is an effort to win back that space of the state, which has become secular over the time, right? So winning back that space requires politicizing the state as well, you know, the state power as well. And that's what we can possibly call today political Islam. Like, say, the case of Islamic Brotherhood, uh, Hassan al-Banna's uh, Islamic Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, if you look at the movement, what is, what is their goal? Because they engage in a lot of social activity, like many of these Islamic group, groups actually do, like jamaat e islami in Pakistan, jamaat e daba in Pakistan. We, don't, we only see them as militant organizations. They're not, because they engage in a lot of social work. And that's exactly what what we see in the case of Islamic Brotherhood as well. So their idea was to state to win back the state power. And that notion of winning back that space of the state from the so-called Western influence is what we today come to came to uh, what we define as political Islam. Just take the case of you know uh, Al Qaeda for that matter, uh, uh, or ISIS for that matter. So what is the model of ISIS? If you see the, the model they propound, it's a very similar model of the prophet, uh, the prophet's time in Medina, Medina of the prophet. You know, you, you, you have a system where there is no distinction between the religious and the secular as such, right? So when we say political Islam today, I would say political Islam is very much a product of Western colonial influence. Because if there was no rupture between the secular and the religious, probably the need for politicizing the state by Muslims or Muslim preachers would not have arisen in the first place.
that'll be my uh, way of understanding it uh okay thank you <clears throat> uh, now uh, uh, you wanted to to research on uh, partition literature in bangla so my next question is on this in bengali literature in west bengal there is hardly any document uh, there is a documentation of partition no doubt mm -hmm. but there is a hardly any reflection on bengali muslims victimization in bengali literature mm -hmm. how uh, would you justify it well uh, it's not very difficult you know recently in fact i wrote a chapter uh, for a book uh, called literature and film uh, and introductory and introductory something i forgot the name of the book Uh, in fact i wrote the introduction to the book i wrote a very long chapter on this very idea and uh, it's it's very easy to understand what we why we don't have something like you know the muslim the muslim experience in partition literature on our side of bengal uh, because on our side of bengal what we see what we read today as partition literature mostly written by bengali hindu writers quote unquote hindu writers right or many of them are even partition refugees who have been who have been writing about their experiences so if you read sunil ganguly's purba paschim for that matter and otin bondopadhyay nil kontho bakir khoje in fact otin otin bondopadhyay's nil kontho bakir khoje is being translated now by jadavpur university press i saw uh, the other day they are going to publish it very soon in english translation profulla roy kya pata nauka then shankar ghosh's trilogy on partition which i have translated and recently my proposal has been approved by a university press uh, hopefully my translation will be out next year i'm hoping so let's see if you see all these like say shankar ghosh for that matter he was himself a partition refugee right his family came from the other side so his three partition novellas are nothing but an autobiographical account of his own family's up to you know up uprooting from east bengal and their journey to west bengal so it's not very difficult to understand for us why we do not have anything like muslim experience yet i would say it's not true i have read gorkishor ghosh's trilogy on partition you know prem nei jol pore patha nore if you read those trilogies it's 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 a scintillating account i would say gorkishor ghosh is one of the most complete accounts of partition in 1947 he starts somewhere long back you know 1890s uh, he starts his first volume the setting of his first volume and the third by the time the third volume comes it's of course partition 1947 and in that you get to see a very close dynamic relation between hindus and muslims in eastern part of india and then how that relation gradually soured you know that became bitter and how muslims felt started feeling gradually isolated from the mainstream hindu community there are reasons i mean now that you know i will talk i'll talk about it of course now that i and dr murshid alam are editing a book all these things are going to be there this whole idea of muslim isolation and how it came to that in you know late uh, 19th century early 20th century beginning it's going to be there but if we read gaur kishor ghosh then we see a very complex intercommunal relation in the eastern part of india bengal likewise shankar ghosh's novel though it's a children's you know this trilogy that i translated this is basically children's uh, uh, no novel as you can call them because it, the partition is narrated through the experience of nilu one child who is an adolescent not even a child and whose family comes to calcutta as refugees there again if you see the second volume of that book supuri bone shari it's all about intercommunal relations on the other side that is in eastern bengal you know how little nilu navigates his relation with his friend muslim friend harun and how harun says toward you know when it comes to almost 1947 harun says east bengal belongs to only to muslims you have no place here so even a child understands you know the whole political repercussions of partition and that it's going to happen so what i mean to say is it is not difficult to see or difficult to see some experiences just that even purbo boschin for that matter we have to be attentive you know we have to be attentive but yes it is predominantly a story of hindu experience no doubt about that muslims do play their part but it's not narrated from the muslim bengali's perspective that is for sure 
Now, I'm sure there are other writers who have done it, like say, Akhtar Zaman Elias, you know, who has, who is a Bangladeshi author, of course. He has uh, these two novels. One is Chilegotha Sepai, which is on 1971. And the other one is on partition. I'm certainly forgetting the name. If you read those ones, he starts, talks about Tevaga movement and all that kind of uh, stuff. You know, but that he comes from to it from a very Marxist perspective, not necessarily from an identitarian perspective. Okay, but I'm not very familiar though with other Muslim writers in Bangladesh who have written about it. So I'm sure there are writers in Bangladesh who have written or written on it. But again, as you know, many historians have said, Aisha Jalal and others, that uh, partition experiences are very different in India and Bangladesh or India and Pakistan. In Pakistan, it was seen more as a kind of celebratory narrative. You know, we won freedom finally from India. Whereas in India, it was more like uh, melancholy because we lost some parts of our country. So these experiences are very different. So I would suggest that maybe we should go back to some of the partition novels, you know, some of these novels that I mentioned already, if we want to understand some of the intricacies of Hindu-Muslim relations in, you know, uh, in 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, we have to go back to those. Those are very important documents, apart from you know critical literature and history, of course. <clears throat> okay, my uh, next question on the same line. Uh, during colonial uh, period, uh, we have seen Muslim leaders, intellectuals, and writers in the urban spaces of Bengal. But after the partition, there is an absolute lack of Muslim intellectuals in Bengal. What is uh, your view on it in the context of present time? Is it changing now? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me take you back you know, to history a bit, because as I said, in my, I remember when we had this base conference last year in 2019, November, and when I was presenting my paper, I had talked about it, that I see a tremendous parallel between what happened in late 19th, early 20th century with what is happening at this very moment when it comes to Bengali Muslim life, society and politics. There's a tremendous similarity. If you go back to that history, you know, in late 18th century, in fact, in 1863, Said uh, Abdul Latif in Calcutta started something called uh, Mohammedan Literary Society. You know, one of the first Bengali, quote unquote Bengali, organizations to be founded by any Muslim in Calcutta. Before that, there was no organization as such. But it was not a political, as you can understand, you know, it was right after the Sipoy Mutiny of 1857, when the Muslims were already the target by the British, because Muslims, British blamed the Muslims, because they said the Muslims were responsible primarily for the rebellion of 1857. So Muslims had to navigate very carefully, just, just the way Said Ahmed, uh, Said Ahmed Khan did. He stayed away from politics. Rather, he advised Muslims to stay away from politics. You know, even nationalist politics, for that matter. Many do accuse him that he was kind of opportunist. He aligned with the British. But the same thing was happening in Calcutta. You know, the. This is the first example of an organization I gave you of Calcutta intellectual, what we call urban intellectual today. So he was one of the early Calcutta intellectuals. And then came in the picture much younger Said Amir Ali. We know many of us, of course, the contribution. Said Amir Ali Avenue in Calcutta is a, you know, we can all see it. They named after him, a lawyer who trained in Britain. He came back to India. He was a, a faculty, he was in the faculty of law of Calcutta. He started something called Central CNMA, Central National Mohammedan Association, in 1877. So we have an ecosystem in Calcutta. It was much more political than Abdul Latif's association. This was more political. He was, in fact, very actively negotiating with the British government on certain demands, you know, that Muslims should be given more jobs in in government sector and all that kind of stuff he was negotiating with, with them. And within first three years or something, he had 600 members in his, in his association, which is amazing if we see in terms of number in those days. Uh, yes, the beginning of, of our intellectual culture has been a very urban, Calcutta-based Bengali, Muslim Bengali intellectual culture. And many of them are not even Bengalis. You know, Saeed Amir Ali would not even call himself Bengali for that matter. 
His family came from uh, Lucknow, Awad, Awad region. He was born in Odisha. Then he was, his family moved to Calcutta, settled in Chuchula, Chinsura. Uh, even Abdul Latif was an, was an Urdu-speaking Muslim. But interestingly, I'm, going, I'm giving a little details about this history because I thought we should know this history. Inter though many of us might be aware already. Interestingly, what happened, this intellectual class in itself saw that it was very limiting you know, for them being in Calcutta, just being, uh, their sphere of influence was very, very small, very small sphere of influence. So they started exerting the influence in the rural areas. As more and more Muslims started getting, uh, you know, uh, educated in madrasas, in rural madrasas, by the beginning of 20th century, a sizable educated Muslim population was emerging gradually. And the mullahs and maulavis in the rural areas had a tremendous influence on this population in rural Bengal. So leaders like Abdul Latif, especially Saeed Amir Ali, thought that if we have to increase our sphere of influence, then we definitely have to go to these mullahs and align ourselves with them. You know, there's a lot of accommodation happening. So as you say, urban intellectual as such doesn't mean anything because urban in, in, intellectuals are kind of, you know, you can say vehicles without wheels. Who will move them? Who would be the cadre? You need a large number of cadre to have influence. And rural Muslims at the beginning of the 20th century gave them that kind of attraction by which they could become these large, big public figures. Otherwise, they were just based in Calcutta. Their appeal was very limited. What today we see, uh, in fact, is very interesting what I feel, that many of us who have come, those who have started base, like Dr. Abu Saleh, Dr. Abul, uh, uh, Abdul Motin, uh, even you, Mr. Dabak, and many others. I'm not taking names. You know, there are so many. Uh, have been part of it, Muhammad, uh, Dr. Mohammad Riyadh. There are so many who have been part of it. Uh, most of them come from very remote rural areas, you know, Birbhum, Murshidabad, and many of these rural places. But isn't it surprising that you still need a Calcutta, you know, to yes. build that, that ecosystem? So that's what an urban area does. You know, you have. You have all the, you can say, the paraphernalia or publicity that you need. Technology to media, everything is housed in that city. And that's why when I read Gaur Kishore Ghosh's novel, Prem Nei, I found just a character like you and I, just a character like all of us, Shafuk, Shafikul, his name, you know. He's the first generation literate guy in his family. His father is a poor farmer. He's the first generation literate who studied in Calcutta. Then he went back and... He had, for the first time, this desire to make Dhaka the intellectual capital of Muslims in, in that part of Bengal. Because he always thought Calcutta is the Hindu intellectual capital. We should have a counterpart of this kind. You know, Dhaka should be the Muslim intellectual capital for Muslims. So what I mean to say is that, yes, the composition of intellectuals among Muslims now has reversed definitely. We see intellectuals are... You know, even uh, I didn't uh, name Dr. Mursid Alam, you know, he's part of the uh, base. Uh, there are so many, as I said, I'm forgetting, you know, I, I don't remember. And I know I've taken only, you know, names of men, not of women. There are many women as well. So this time around, we see a reverse process that many of these intellectuals have come from rural areas. So they have a very rural sensibility, which is very important. Because at the beginning of 20th century, the kind of, or late 19th century, the kind of intellectual culture we saw was very urban and disconnected from rural real reality completely. First of all, they didn't even speak Bangla for that matter, you know, those guys. So this time around, it's different. But yet, I would say we need an urban ecosystem to sustain this kind of an intellectual culture. Because many of us are educated in urban universities who have come through the system, you know, who have read the same sort of authors critiques, theories, to understand self-reflexively what it means to be a Muslim at this, at this very moment in, in 21st century or late 20th century, right? So what we see in the last 15, 20 years, the emergence of a sizable Muslim middle class is a revelation because they come from rural areas, yet they have a very urban sensibility 
without being blind to rural Muslim populace as such. So that's that's kind of unique, I would say. It's very unlike what happened in early, you know, 20th century and late 19th century. That's a difference. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. So uh, now it is a general notion that Bengali Muslim women and other sexual groups are considered the most marginalized section of the society. How do the so-called progressive people and the left liberal politics address those issues? Well, I mean, we are going back to this same question of the women's question, right? The way at one point in, in colonial India, we had the Hindu women's question in late 19th century, when we had all these social reformers who were focusing on the, you know, on the figure of the Hindu woman, basically. They were trying to produce a Western educated to an extent who, who could be Western woman, yet who would retain all the traditional values of being a Hindu woman. Right. So the figure of, of the woman became this very site of struggle between, you can say, multiple competing uh, uh, agencies. Like the colonial powers are fighting on the figure of the woman, Hindu woman, to reform her, to reform Hindu society. We see Western educated Indians were fighting, keeping the woman at the center, how to reform her enough, yet she should also be the bearer of tradition, as Pater Chatterjee says. And then you have the third group of men who were the traditional men who thought that Sati Pratha was still, you know, should be practiced. Likewise, what I see at this very moment, I see a similar kind of struggle. I think a Bengali Muslim woman would be better, uh, better, I can say, uh, better able to answer this question than I can. But what I see as an as an observer, you know, literary political observer, someone who researches, I can say that I see a similar kind of competing force at this moment. On the one hand, you have the state. You know, the, the triple talaq uh, sort of legislation has already shown us. On the one hand, we have the state, which is fighting in the name of the Muslim woman, the so-called quote-unquote Muslim woman, you know, to modernize. So to modernize the Hindu Muslim society, the state wants to modernize Muslim man's attitude to Muslim women, first of all. Right? So one that is one. Then we have seen other organizations like, say, uh, All India Muslim in... I forget, I mean, I mean, I mean, political party, you know, or for that matter, uh, All India Personal Muslim Law Board, which took out huge rallies in some parts of India saying Muslim women want the tri triple talaq to stay here, right? They don't want to dispense with triple talaq. They want, in fact, they took out rallies in support of triple talaq. So on the one hand, then you have Muslim men who are fighting to keep traditional life quote unquote tradition, you know, it's not a tradition, by the way, triple talaq is not even a tradition in Pakistan anymore, or many Muslim countries, but in India, it's still considered to be part of the tradition. I don't know why, but it is somehow considered that it's part of the tradition. So we have the state, we have Muslim men who are fighting on the body of, you know, the, uh, the figure of Muslim women. And then you have the third group, the Hindu men, the liberal Hindu men, how do the liberal Hindu men see? I'm not talking the state, by the way. Liberal Hindu men, they look at Muslim men as someone who oppress their women. It is the truth. You know, so when they give a Muslim man a job, Muslim women a job, they feel they are rescuing her from the violent Muslim man. That's a liberal perspective. That's a liberal way of you know fighting this battle on the figure of the Muslim woman. So. We are all trying to rescue Bengali Muslim women in some way or the other. You know, we are all, the state is trying to rescue her. Muslim men are trying to rescue her. A liberal Muslim, liberal Hindus are trying to rescue her. I would like to see more of Muslim women themselves speaking than we rescuing them. Because it doesn't make sense to me at the end of the day, you know. We should know what they are thinking, how do they want to be rescued? And that's where lies the problem. You know, take the case of Triple Talaq for that matter. When Miss Somani from Bombay was fighting this battle on behalf of Muslim women, that Triple Talaq should be abolished. We have seen the kind of abuse they receive from Muslim men, you know, many Muslim men. It, 
So men who say that there should not be any kind of interference in personal law, and we have a panel coming up, in fact, right? Okay. Anyways, the the question is, how do we as liberal Muslims, forget about liberal Hindus, how do we as liberal Muslims should look at this issue? Uh, well, again, I will be aware from many others I know because I'm not a person who is good at negotiation in the sense. For me, what is important is, you know, I would be it would be either or or for me. If you ask me, so if you say he's he's wearing, you know, burqa, part of our cultural tradition, I would say no. There's no burqa in Prophet's time as well, you know. So I am I am staunchly against some of these practices. Triple talaq. No way any civilized society can allow triple talaq. That's my way of looking at it, right? Because I'm not even saying as a progressive Muslim. I'm saying that this is not even sanctioned anywhere. I I have read widely on this, and I've seen countries like even Tunisia, even they had something called triple talaq, which is now done away with, which is not there anymore. So I don't know how we, we justify some of these practices. So yes, Muslim women being on the margin, you know, being uh, on the margin, I think uh, it, doesn't really, it doesn't require much uh, persuasion to understand this, that they are, and we should let them speak more than we are doing for that. That's my point. Uh, yes, my next question on the same line, how do you define the identity of Bengali Muslim? In the past context of historical and cultural accommodation and integration with the local media. Well, uh, it's it's a difficult question to be honest, but I'll try to answer it. It's a difficult question because what is Bengali Muslim or what is Muslim Bengali? It is a very complicated question. I'd go back again in history. I'm sorry to go back in history so much because you know, some of these things would not make sense otherwise. You know, if we read Richard Eaton's very famous book on Bengali Muslims, he goes back in history and he says that when uh, Bakhtiar Khilji first came and sacked Bengal in 1204, you know, from that time, all the way to almost for next two, three centuries, the only reference we have of Bengali Muslims were about Qazis and others who were mostly seen as, you know, uh, either Said, uh, Pathan, Sheikh, Mughals, right? Those sort of what we today call the Ashraf Muslims. Now, Gradually, as we see the Mughal rule started in Bengal around 1576, around that time uh, in, in the Delta, Bengal Delta, from 16th century onwards, gradually we get to know that, you know, if we read the literary works, we see the emergence of an indigenous Bengali Muslim identity in the sense non Ashraf Muslim identity for the first time. Most of these Muslims were referred to as artisans, you know, they were working as potters and in you know other kinds of work they were doing stitching and all that kind of work so they were mostly uh, these all these uh, non ashraf muslims being mentioned for the first time now how did these muslims came to be i mean how did they come to be in the delta so far away from the center of mughal power in delhi or you know this is kind of absurd when in 1872 for the first time the census was being done by the British, suddenly they found a large number of Bengali speaking Muslims in the Delta, you know, in, in the Eastern Delta. And they were surprised that how did this happen? Where did this, these Muslims come from here? Now, a debate ensued after 1872 uh, census was published. Suddenly there was one uh, Said Ghaznavi, I'm forgetting his full name, from Maiman Singh, he wrote a tract. He said most of these Muslims are not converted Muslims at all because the census said the only way we can possibly explain the presence of such a large number of Muslims here could be because they are converted from uh, from uh, you know lower class lower caste uh, Hindus. 
But the Said Ghaznavi, who was supposed to be one Ashraf Muslim, he said, no, most of the Muslims are not converted. In fact, they all came from outside India, you know, from Persia, from Arab countries, and from other parts of the uh, other other parts outside India. Now this debate continued. You know, Henry Beverly was the, in fact, the census commissioner for the first census in 1872. In 1894, James Wise wrote an article again, in which he said, the only way we can explain the presence of this big Muslim population here is by saying that they are not at all, you know, foreigners. They didn't come from outside India. They are indigenous Muslims who converted. Again, the very next year, someone called Fazle Rabi, a Bengali Muslim, he said, no, most of these Muslims were foreigners. No. So this debate has continued uh, for, for too long. And to cut this argument, line of argument short, the only thing I would like to say is, if you look at the late 18th again, sorry, late 19th and early 20th century, with the politicization of Muslims, the more and more Muslims became educated and they became politicized, they started seeing themselves as a separate community altogether. They didn't want to identify with Hindus with the Hindus anymore. They wanted to create their own identity. They wanted a separate Muslim identity for themselves. Right. So the debate continued whether they are Bengali Muslims or Muslim Bengalis. And this debate, in fact, if you read someone like uh, the historian, what's her name, uh, who wrote these two books, she teaches in England, certainly I'm forgetting her name, uh, Joya Chatterjee. You know, she says, even if you read in in, if you read Sharachandra Chattopadhyay, even Sharachandra was very much exasperated that they are, why do these Muslims not identify as Bengalis? So in a way, when Sharachandra writes about, you know, a football match was going on between Muslims and Bengalis, he is not very wrong in some senses. Now that I read more and more about Muslim history, I understand this. Because Muslims from the beginning of, you know, late 19th, beginning of early 20th century did not want to identify as, as Bengalis at all. They wanted to identify themselves as Muslims first. You know, and even and that battle of how to be a Muslim was focused mostly on the language question again at the time. Because Muslims were wanting to speak or did speak a kind of vulgar language the Puthi, Puthi language, or mix of Arabic, Persian, and Bangla, which is spoken even today, you know, in Bangladesh. When I visited Bangladesh in 2011, I found uh, their Bangla is so very different. It's so Arabized and so Persianized. You know, a lot of these Urdu words in their Bangla, which are mingled. And that's the kind of Puthi Bangla, which became the bone of contention between Bengali Muslims and Hindu Muslims. So when Calcutta University wanted uh, to introduce Bangla as medium of instruction, in the early, early 20th century, many Muslim leaders, in fact, like uh, Suravardi and others, they said, no, we do not want Bengali to be introduced. If you want introduce Bengali, then you are introducing a Bengali which is derived from Sanskrit. It's a Hindu language. It is not the language of Bengali Muslims. You have to then introduce something called Puthi language or a kind of Arabized, Persianized Bangla. If you do that, only then we'll agree to it. Now, this battle has been going on for too long. Now, uh, to come back to your question, I mean, how do we then define this identity, right? I mean, if we, I think that debate has been sort of resolved. We are not anymore in early 20th century. We are no longer debating whether we should be Muslim first or Bengali next. I think much of it has been resolved because of the partition in 1947. You know, the partition in some ways forced us to say that we are Indians first. Likewise, ethnically, if we identify, we are Bengalis first, you know, even before you are Muslim. So in a way, the partition did something that was unprecedented. It, it made us think again in terms of ethnicity more than in terms of religion, because there was a survival in post-partition Bengal, post-partition India as well. OK, I don't know if it answers your question. No, uh, it's absolutely okay. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Khan, uh, you are editing a book on Bengali Muslim with, uh, I think, uh, Professor Murshid Alam. 
Yes. So, what is going to be major issues of the book? Well, uh, when in 2017 we edited uh, an issue of a magazine which I edit, which is called Cafe de Census. So, in 2017. I and Dr. Mursad Alam, we edited an issue of Catholic Census on Bengali Muslim. Because by that time I had met, you know, I met Dr. Abu Saleh, Dr. Ab uh, Abdul Mutin, all these people back, back in 2011 in Hyderabad. That's the first time I met them. And we had been discussing for a long time, you know, about Bengali Muslims and what is happening with them and why do we have so few Bengali Muslims who are in universities studying. You know, you can imagine when I was doing my my undergraduate degree from 93 to 96 was my undergraduate degree. Uh, at that time, there were hardly many Bengali Muslims who were actually studying. You, know, you can't even believe in these 20 years, 20, 24 years, things have changed so much. You know, so it has drastically changed. So, by 2017, we have been talking about it for a while. By 2017, we realized that now, after I met you know all these other people uh, in different places, I realized that there is now finally the emergence of a nucleus of Bengali Muslims. You know that educated Bengali Muslims are now focused somewhere. Of course, you know simultaneously, we the uh, uh, Alami Mission was doing wonderful work. I'm not getting into that part, of course. But I was not meeting any of those doctors and engineers. You know, somehow we don't meet that much. I was meeting mostly people who teach in university. I met uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mursad Alam first time, I think, in 2012, January, in Malda. Because I had gone to uh, Goldbongo University for a lecture. And then uh, Dr. Mursad Alam invited me to his college. The very next day, I also spoke in that college. So, then I actually started thinking, you know, realizing that finally the time has come when we can coalesce as a group. We can, you know, we can talk about ourselves as Muslims. Finally, that time has come. So 2017, I and Dr. Mursad Alam, we decided that let's finally edit an issue of Catholic Census. Because we have reached a critical mass of scholars who can now talk about the Bengali Muslim issue. Until then, it was extremely difficult to find even ten scholars who could do it. You know, I didn't find it. So that's how an issue of Catholic Census was published in 2017. Then, after that, we started thinking, why not convert this into a book? Because the magazine is not an, you know, it's a popular kind of magazine. It's not an academic magazine in that sense. So we had in the magazine maybe 10, 12 uh, uh, contributors. I'm, I don't remember exactly. So what we did now, we have expanded the scope of the book. I have included many others. In fact, I am Dr. Alam. We have invited many others like Moidul Islam from PSSC. Then we have uh, uh, who, who has written that book on Calcutta, uh, Muslims in Calcutta. Uh, anyways, I'm very sorry. So yes, so this book is going to be uh, for the first time in post-partition Bengal, a uh, first time uh, in English, at least I know, you know, research book, academic book on Bengali Muslims and different aspects of their life. So we have articles on Bengali Muslim identity, on history, on culture, like Bengali Muslim women's wearing songs. Then we have articles on education, madrasa education. Uh, then we have on poets like Kazin Azul Islam, then we have on Bengali Muslim writers, contemporary Bengali Muslim writers who are writing in Bangla. So it's a, you can say it's a kind of compendium of many aspects of Bengali Muslim life. We have named it tentatively at the moment. The proposal is now going through a review actually with a, with a university publisher, University Press. So we'll know the result, you know, in next maybe three weeks or so. At the moment it's under review. But hopefully even this book should be ideally speaking out by next year. Hoping. Okay, so yeah, so it's an expanded version of that journal issue, but you know it's an academic book, right? And if it if it comes out next year, then we'll even think of translating it in Bangla. That's what we can reach a larger readership in Bengal itself. 
Yes, uh, we are waiting, uh, eagerly waiting for uh, this book actually. Uh, so uh, now my next question is that um, on different context, uh, I looked at in an interview uh, on 7 June 2020, Professor Partho Chatterjee remarked, and I quote, caste hegemony is so complete in Bengal that it is uh, invisible. Now my uh, question to you that, that how would you uh, analyze the caste politics in West Bengal? And how does the caste ideology operate within Bengali Muslim community? Well, again, it's a very difficult question. I mean, in what Professor Chatterjee said, I read that interview actually long back when it was published. Ajay Guravarti did that interview, in fact. I, was, I read that. Uh, though one more thing I would say about that interview, maybe not now, something I don't agree with in that interview, uh, in which Professor Chatterjee says that most Bengali upper caste Hindus are now leaving Bengal because, you know, because the lot of these OBCs, SCs and STs and Muslims and all are occupying an important space in Bengal, Bengali academia. So many of them are leaving. I don't agree with that at all. Bengali upper caste uh, Hindus are not leaving Bengal. They are very much staying in Bengal. They are very much occupying the academia the way they were doing before. Much more now. You know, now if you have a surplus, they go out often if they don't get the right kind of opportunity. Okay, coming to this question. <coughs> Caste hegemony does not operate in Muslim societies the way it does in Hindu society, as not in Bengal. I would say one of the reasons why it doesn't operate that way, that's because we have been very far away from the center of Muslim hegemonic culture in North India. You know, if you look at UP and Bihar, or UP especially Delhi and that region, there's a clear distinction between Ashraf and uh, Atrap, you know, the upper caste and so-called lower caste Muslims. This is dark, in fact, you know, and that's why we have many of these movements on, on that part of uh, in Bihar and other places. But in Bengal, it's much more fuzzy. That's because in Bengal from the very beginning, in fact, it's Richard Eaton says that in Bengal, this division between Ashraf and Atrap became blurred to an extent where there has, we have been too far away from the center of that culture, Muslim culture in North India. And there have been a lot of accommodation. So when the census, you know, 1872 census, after that, we find a lot of Bengali Muslims were claiming they were sheikhs in Bengal. Now, sheikh would mean they came from Arab, right? Ar Arabia, Saudi Arabia. They, Of course, well, how, how can there be millions of sheikhs in Bengal? They couldn't come possibly from Saudi Arabia. So caste in Bengal in that sense. First of all, you know, it's a contested term. Who is an upper caste in, if we talk about caste hegemony, who is an upper caste Muslim in Bengal? Are we talking about those four castes like, you know, uh, Said, Sheikh, Mughal, Pathan, the way we say the four, you know, upper caste? Rather, I would say what has happened in India, uh, sorry, in Bengal, it's a kind of fuzziness of caste identity. I have grown up in a community, I can say for sure, I've grown up in a community which identifies itself as Pathan community. We speak at home with my mother. I, I still don't speak Bangla actually with my mother. You know, nor do I speak Urdu. It's a hodgepodge language that I speak with my mother. But with my dad, I speak Bangla. With my sisters, I speak Bangla. So in our family, when we speak, you will see switching codes all the time happening. You know, if three of us, four of us sitting there, we are speaking simultaneously in two, three different languages, Bangla, to that hodgepodge language, again, switching back to something else, English, maybe sometimes with my sisters. It's a kind of constant switching code. So I come from a community of that kind. I know it, you know. It's a very endogamous community. In our families, until our generation, people didn't even marry outside the community. They'll marry only Khans. So this is a kind of, if you want to talk about, you know, caste, endogamy, the way it happens. Only in my generation, I found people are marrying outside. And I, I'm giving this example, there is a reason. Now, when my elder sister, I have two sisters, when my elder sister's marriage came about, we did not marry her with another Khan. What is the reason? The reason is very simple. We found most of these so-called Khans in that region, Hugli, Bardhaman, and our part of Pakura, they are not educated enough. 
neither guys nor nor girls because they were always dependent on land you know that was all the reasons why they didn't bother to study much rather we found other communities in bengal where educationally much more forward they were educationally much more adept so we wanted someone who is educated for our sister right who has studied who is doing something with his life so that's how that's why i say caste hegemony the way i understand it in bengal it does not operate exactly the way it operates among hindu bengalis uh, because i would say much more than so called upper caste in in among bengali muslims barring the urdu speaking urban muslims forget about them i'm not even talking about them you know i'm talking about mostly bengali speaking muslims in rural bengal if you see in rural bengal other communities have done better who are not even called obcs or anything so far other backward classes you know they are not even given that tag but they were called sheikh let's say and others and they have done tremendously well educationally because many of them didn't have much land that was one of the advantages let me tell you that not having land is that advantage i come from a family i know it very well if you have land people mostly do not even go to school they are just dependent on the land you know that's all they do basically they know okay somehow we'll survive you know for generations we have done it we'll do it so caste hegemony among muslims in bengal i i would not agree that it it actually operates the way it operates among hindus uh, hindu upper caste it simply doesn't it 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 doesn't i have never seen upper caste so called upper caste muslims having any edge forget about obc reservation now you know even before that i have never seen them having any edge over other muslim communities in bengal so i would say pathu charaji's argument could be right for hindu caste hegemony but when it comes to muslims i would say the obc muslims or other backward classes or so called lower caste muslims have done much better than some of the upper caste muslims in bengal Uh, yes, uh, this is fascinating explanation. Uh, now, uh, my next question: uh, How does cultural hegemony within educational institution function? This we have been going on talking about. Just the other day, I was having this long, long debate with uh, Dr. Musa Alam on this. I mean, you know, we know how caste hegemony functions uh, in India. Uh, if we didn't have say reservation we would we know our despite having reservation we know in an institute like jnu 90 to 95% of the faculty members are all upper caste you know you may have positive discrimination in the form of reservation but that doesn't guarantee that it will lead to appointment of people right it doesn't necessarily lead to appointment of teachers from these categories especially not not until now you know now we see a very we would say a much more proactive government we'll see in bengal that's because of the experience of uh, left front government and we know how left front government lost one of the reasons was because the muslims left them they didn't support them anymore and i think uh, so mamta banerjee's government was trying to be a little more proactive from the beginning and he felt that obc reservation is now something that we have to work on otherwise it's going to get out of hand this you know 27% of muslim population could swing things in either way so but yet how does how does hegemony work you know many i have seen many people getting angry with me when i whenever i talk about merit you know there is a reason why i do that sometimes otherwise you know positive discrimination is fine let reservation be there for those who want to be appointed through the reservation through that system but what if i don't want to avail reservation let let's say you know i go for a job interview and it has happened with me and i know either i have not been called for an interview because they knew if i go there i i am the you know the most well well qualified candidate in bengal at that point in time for that post so they have to take me i have not even called i have not been called for interview it has happened it has happened in last two years i have seen it you know or they would not they would take deliberately and upper caste uh, candidate when it comes to recruitment but forget about recruitment process you know let's talk about the general caste hegemony the way it fun- functions uh you know the whole idea of cultural superiority 
because for me caste hegemony is nothing but a superiority complex the way i look at it uh, because people who have three generations of social and cultural capital would always think they are superior much superior than those who are building it for the first time because my father of course had college education he did a bsc my mother didn't have even her 10th you know so i just don't know where i stand my mother got married when she was in her 10th standard she didn't even pass her exam she got married sama so i was born when she was maybe 18 or something so when it comes to first generation sort of people who are aspiring for higher education you know masters phd and all that kind of stuff for us first thing would the most intimidating thing would be encountering people in the academia who have three generations or four generations of cultural and social capital the way they talk to you the way they look down on you sometimes the way you know it could be a very very intimidating experience you know maybe one of the good things i did i didn't live in bengal i just left it after my undergraduate degree i went off to hyderabad and since then i have not encountered much bengal because even today when i see uh, it's a such a hegemonic space uh, bengali academia is such an upper caste hegemonic space that you know they cannot even consider that that others exist in that space it doesn't even somehow register in their imagination uh, to a great extent right so i'll come to it later on though how i think we can counter it i, I i'll talk about it <clears throat> okay uh, please uh... Dr. Khan, please share your views uh, on moral crisis of Bengali Muslim. We have seen that uh, some kind of moral crisis the Bengali Muslim are suffering. So please share your views. Uh, I I don't know really what you mean by moral crisis crisis among Bengali Muslims. Do you have any specific instance in mind? Uh, yes, uh, you look that in the upper uh, in the in urban spaces or uh, institution like. Uh, and uh, jadavpur or presidency where you look that uh, uh, i can that's mean bangla boli tale amader larger larger audience er subidha hobe to sekhane ki hocche je ami sekhane salam dite giye je keu salam dicche assalam alaikum ki bole ami seta ke uttor dicche lukiye alaikum assalam chotto kore ekta uttor dicchi jeno onno keu na jate na bujhte pare je amar identity ta ami salam dicchi ami ekta practicing muslim and etc আরেকটা বিষয় হচ্ছে যে এই টোটাল সি এন আর সি মুভমেন্ট এখানে দেখা গেছে যে যারা মুভমেন্ট করছে তাদের হাতে প্রচুর পরিমাণে ন্যাশনাল এটা এক প্রকার মনে হচ্ছে যে মুসলিম যে আইডেন্টিটি মোরাল ক্রাইসিস ভুগছে সেটাকে নতুন করে ডিফেন্ড করা তো এই কনটেক্সটা আপনার কি মতামত আচ্ছা মানে মোরাল ক্রাইসিস ইন দা সেন্স কি যে মুসলিমরা যেভাবে তাদের আইডেন্টিটিটাকে লোকাতে চাইছে এই সেন্সে বা কাউচ করতে চাইছে এই ন্যাশনাল আইডেন্টিটি ইন দ্যাট সেন্স এটা এক প্রকার মানে ধর্মীয় যে আইডেন্টিটিটাকে সেটাকে লোকানো একটা সেন্সে দেখা যাচ্ছে তো এইটা এটাতে কি মানে মানুষের যে টেন্ডেন্সি হচ্ছে যে সে হচ্ছে প্র্যাকটিসিং মুসলিম অথচ সেই মুসলিম যে আইডেন্টিটিটা সেটা আমরা পাবলিক স্পেসে লোকাতে চাইছি এবং ট্রেনে বাসেও সেটা হচ্ছে যে যখন আমাদের এটা হচ্ছে নাম যখন বলছে মানে সালাম যখন দিচ্ছি সেটা এরকমই হচ্ছে খুব আস্তে করে ছোট করে কিংবা অ্যাভয়েড করছি কিংবা কোনো মুসলিম মানে খুব সাধারণ ঘটনা কোনো মুসলিম গ্রুপে আছি সেটা ট্রেনে বাসে দেখতে অসুবিধা হচ্ছে অস্বস্তি হচ্ছে তো এই এই যে টোটাল যে ন্যারেটিভটা এটা কনটেক্সটা আপনি কি বলবেন এটা আমি বলবো আমি ইংরেজিতেই বলছি কারণ আমি জানি না সবাই বাঙালি নাকি এখানে আমি এটা বলবো যে ইট ইজ নট আ মরাল ক্রাইসিস অফ বেঙ্গলি মুসলিম ইট ইজ আ মরাল ক্রাইসিস অফ হিন্দু বেঙ্গলি ইট ইজ দেয়ার মরাল ক্রাইসিস ইট ইজ নট আর মরাল ক্রাইসিস ইউ নো ইফ আর সোসাইটি ইজ নট লেটিং আস এক্সপ্রেস আর সেলফ ফ্রিলি ইট ইজ নট আর ক্রাইসিস ইট ইজ দেয়ার ক্রাইসিস but at the same time i understand what you are trying to say you know i do understand we have all gone through this even today i feel conscious sometimes when i travel by public transport you know sometimes we you know when someone asks me and i have had many experiences of that kind as well i last i was remembering last i remember last year i was traveling to delhi from katak in rajdhani express so this is you know my coupe full of uh, uh, army people they are traveling in that 
they are all going from delhi when i was going back from delhi to katak so they all we are full of army people as the only civilian there with them and then a couple of guys started talk about you know muslims are doing this muslims are doing that and they were asking my opinion on that they didn't know my name by the way so it went on like some four hours or something you know and finally when they asked me so what's your name when i said my name is musharraf khan they were shocked they were like really we are so sorry we didn't know we didn't understand you know till then they were like they said all sorts of things about muslims now i don't see it as my moral crisis i see it as their moral crisis basically you know that they it is their problem not my problem but at the same time i i know that you know many of you will disagree with me on this point i am also not very fond of identity assertion i know many people don't agree with me on this why i say i am not very fond of identity assertion is because if you are getting to that point of extreme my video is off no my video is on yes it's okay yeah okay so uh sorry i lost the thread of thinking okay yeah why i i consider that you know identity politics would be more dangerous to muslims look at the recent case in in uh, northeast delhi the riot that happened it reached a point where there was on the one hand muslim assertion someone is mute someone has muted my microphone i suppose sorry okay so on the one hand you have a uh, muslim identity assertion on the other hand you have this hindu identity assertion now when things get out of hand you know just before that happened i remember i was having a discussion with some of my colleagues faculty members here in uh, jindal actually and i said i do not support this extreme identity assertion these muslims will pay for it and they did pay for it finally in uh, northeast delhi who suffered mostly and who suffers when things get out of hand you know that's why i feel sometimes there is no harm possibly in doing a little bit of negotiation little bit of camouflaging i don't see much of a harm in that and i have always said this that it's it's again a very middle class crisis if i know many women who come from bonga and other other places in south 24 parganas who travel every day to calcutta who work in uh, hindu houses hiding their names right i mean uh, what are we fighting for are we fighting for just to prove that we are muslims or we are fighting for some other things advancement of the community so uh, i would kind of agree but at the same time i know it's a very complex ecosystem that we are inhabiting at the moment i have seen younger muslims are very different from what we were two decades ago two and a half decades ago there is a very strong undercurrent of identity assertion at this moment which is not there in even though i grew up you know after babri masjid was demolished in 1992 i was a high school student in class 11 i was think i was about to go to class 12 i was living in uttar para there was a riot happening around me i was uh, staying on rent in a hindu household and that family in fact came from bangladesh during partition in their house i was staying on rent and they gave me shelter they gave me food during those five days when people are killed around everywhere in fact there were people who were being murdered in lilua which is just next to next to uttar para you know even even then growing up in that kind of an atmosphere we were not or maybe because of that experience we grew up in a different milieu altogether you know where we were not asserting our identity all that much maybe that's something in me even now that has stayed in me and i was today publishing an article on jacques darida for cafe de census and how he always remain an outsider because of his experience of growing up as an algerian jew in algeria though they were given french citizenship later on but you know he was excluded when he was in school for one year he was kicked out of school because he was a jewish guy so all his life he kind of developed this aversion towards these closed boxes of identity maybe that's like something like that has 
happen to people like me as well. You know, I have never been boxed. I didn't want to be boxed by any specific identity. I always wanted to exceed that identity. I, I always felt. But then I understand that we are now inhabiting a space where there's a different generation of Muslims for whom identity is very important. You know, they, they want to assert because this is uh, the generation mostly, I would say, indoctrinated or trained by televangelist. Uh, what's his name? Uh, who is not in India anymore. Uh, this guy who preaches through television, this Muslim guy. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Jakir Naik, you are talking about Jakir. Jakir Naik. You know, this is a this is a, a, a generation of Muslims who have been trained by Zakir Naik to an extent. You know, also this is a generation of people who have seen 2002 riots in Gujarat, and it has affected again. You know, maybe 1992 still was something we could absorb, but 2002, 10 years later, something that happened. I think that has again, you know, sort of produced a trauma for many, and many have now thought if. As Muslims, we are getting hunted, then why not express our identity as Muslims, right? And then in that vacuum came people like Zakir Naik and other preachers who have taken advantage. I am saying it, who has taken advantage of that, of, you know, making people more Muslim once more in some senses. Because they also, you know, filled this vacuum where they started telling people, you are, you are suffering because you are a Muslim. So why not become proper Muslim, pure Muslim? you know, tech, uh, scriptural Muslim once more. So there are multiple competing factors that, that have worked on, you know, to produce this identity. So I would not say it's a moral crisis for Muslims. I would say it's a moral crisis for Hindus. Uh, I mean, in a way to put it. Yeah. Yes, just a, this is a very wonderful explanation. Uh, now, my next question is, that what is your view on lynching and Islamophobia? And how can you differentiate uh, the nature of Islamophobia in India and Western countries? Well, uh, I don't think I need to really say much about Islam. Uh, sorry, uh, lynching. We all know. Uh, if we go back also to the African American experience, we know lynching is not just lynching. It's not just a physical act. It's a symbolic act. Lynching is always symbolic. It's a lynching is always symbolic of. You know, it's a, it symbolizes power, right? Raw power on bare bodies, to use Agamemnon's term. The bodies which have no power, no, no law can anymore safeguard them. So in a sense, when a Muslim gets lynched, it's simply a performative act of showing how Hindus can assert their masculinity. That's how we should be lynched. That's exactly how the white Americans, you know, were treating the African Americans in, in, in America. So it was a performative act, basically, performative masculine act. It's not just lynching. So let's 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 try to understand that. There are different ways uh, the state has tried to emasculate Muslims in post 1947 India in different ways. That's why many Muslims want to hold on to something like triple talaq is very simple, because Muslim men feel castrated, quote unquote. Muslim men, men feel they are being de, they are being emasculated by the state. That I am I am not man enough to defend my woman anymore. I am not man enough to defend my you know uh, my community anymore. And this is a psychological game, basically. That's how the state plays on the psyche of people. Uh, so for Muslims, in many ways, lynching is a symbolic act to to show, uh, as they say, to show your place where you belong exactly. You know, in 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 a in an imaginary Hindu land. When it comes to Islamophobia, I would say that, you know, I had never thought what we see today. You know, in India, when we are growing up, we could not even imagine that this could be Islamophobia. We could simply see it as communalism, right? Nowadays, I see more and more the term communalism is being is almost absent, and Islamophobia has taken over. That's very interesting, though. There are a couple of reasons for this, the way I look at it. One is the global discourse post-1979 Iranian revolution, and more recently, of course, post-9-11. Uh, post-9-11, uh, Islamophobia in the West has also made a mark in our part of the world, the way I look at it. Because post, you know, the way post-9-11 has spawned all these Islamic movements around the globe, whether it be Al-Qaeda or ISIS, 
you know it has immediately produced a kind of idea in the mind of people in india also like hindus and others that islam is a violent religion islam is islam is is a terroristic religion in that sense so islamophobia i would say at this at this very moment the way we understand it is is more derived from uh, the global events that are happening around us than what has happened in india because we know there is no group of indian muslim getting in large numbers with any of those global islamic movements right but we do know the the discourse of islamophobia is mostly imported because of the kind of things that are happening in the middle east that has happened in the us and other parts of the world so it's a more global effect of islam's problematic relationship with the west that we are looking at in india at the moment that is from own relationship with the indian society or state as such because in india i don't see there has been much of a change because in, in india we have not seen any big you know a large scale islamic movement as well we haven't seen that unlike in pakistan or bangladesh in india we have not seen any large scale islamic movement we have not seen any large scale terrorist movement if barring a few you know uh, incidents if we just ignore them indian muslim society has morally remained the same the way it used it was before so then where does this idea of islamophobia then come from i would say its origins and the way it has spread around the globe is very much in the middle east and other parts of the world okay like in the past we are inhabiting because we live in this global world we are we are sort of importing some of these terms and you know categories and frameworks to understand indian muslim and muslim society okay uh, i'll ask my next uh, question on this is the last question and uh, after that we will receive uh, i think uh, we have we can receive two three questions sure, so sure. i would request uh, uh, the audience to write their questions uh, or the their name uh, so my last question is that from the perspective of psychoanalysis uh, how do the ca and nrc all this uh, uh, affect bengali muslims or muslims overall in uh, india hmm. interesting question okay so if we have to you know kind of use freud here in a way i would say that if india is now you know the every day is more or less kind of the rational ordered life is hindu then islam is a kind of eruption in that you know islam is the kind of eruption that disturbs this sort of equilibrium in society muslims are the kind of disruptive factor in it right it's one way to understand it that that the rash so when the state clamps down on muslims when they kill muslims in the name of law and order in up and other places you know so ca what does ca do basically if we try to understand it psychoanalytically it does nothing but in a way to quell an eruption of the irrational so demand for removal of ca then becomes an irrational act in the eyes of the state you know if we try to understand it from a freudian perspective because the society the rational order of the society should accept hindus and other minorities from other parts you know of the subcontinent into india that's the most rational uh, thing to do so when muslims protest against it uh, they simply they are behaving in an quot unquot irrational fashion according to the this rational everyday right in the eyes of the larger community so that's one way in the other sense i don't know how we can use freud but uh i would say you know if we look at uh, the unconscious in terms of muslims and how he has affected them i would say you know it's a constant struggle between uh id and ego that is unconscious and our consciousness when it comes to muslims what i mean by that let me explain i mean by that is that muslims as such do not object to ca by what i mean by that is muslims do not object to the idea that 
persecuted people should be welcomed muslims are not against it let's get this right you know because no muslim has ever said that we should not welcome because we are welcoming rohingyas anyways you know we want to welcome rohingyas we want to welcome persecuted people that has that that has i think you know muslims have never objected to that so at the level of the you know you can say consciousness uh, ego at the level of consciousness muslims want to accept others in twin yet at the level of the eid the unconscious muslims are scared there there is a residue or residual fear persistent residual fear in their psyche in their unconscious that if we accept these others in india the very next step would be for us that we we'll lose our citizenship in some ways so i would say it's a persistent struggle between our conscious and the unconscious the id and the you know and the ego and in that i think some of us are already mentally affected because we know that there is no uh, there is no we cannot possibly be driven by logic at this very moment we simply cannot accept others because if we accept others persecuted others we have to finally lose out in this battle and that has gravely affected muslims yes uh, i think rohan we have some questions yeah sure uh, so we have taken long it is one and a half hours and i'm surprised that there is still around yes. over here yeah yes uh, i can see uh, uh, questions don't you believe that uh, the social exclusion has played a major role in binding muslims to assert their religious identity in recent times is it not that such apprehension has affected uh, the psyche of the kids who uh, grew up uh, in the last two decades yeah i mean uh, yeah definitely that's what i was saying you know after 92 happened then happened 2002 and that created you, that was like the final nail in, nail in the coffin of uh, indian muslims uh, in 2002 was also happened to be the year when i got my job in uh, as teaching in kershong and uh, you know it was such a traumatic experience to you know first year of job and suddenly i find all these discussions in the staff room so definitely i would say i would agree fully with it that there is an experience of exclusion because group thinking often is a result of you know uh, this thinking of being excluded group thinking emerges Uh, sorry uh, group think or any identity emerges identity is never uh, you know uh, built on the notion of only essence that's just one way of understanding identity that identity has an essence so what is my identity muslim identity is built on certain notions essential notions like muslims will pray muslims will do this muslims will eat this kind of food that's just one way of understanding identity right the other idea of identity is identity is always constructed in terms of the other if you do not have an other that's again you know in a freudian sense you can say if you do not have the other you cannot congeal into a group into an identity so definitely the sense of exclusion has played a definite role but along with that i would say the sense of exclusion has played but a certain kind of fear psychosis has also been played deliberately you know some people have played a fear psychosis in this you will be extinguished and i would blame our left to a great extent for that you know though they have always played the savior of muslims i would say they have also congress left have also played on the fear of muslims so that our exclusion today you know sense of exclusion being excluded is also born out of actual persecution and to an extent i would say imaginary persecution because let's take the case of ca you know i know it's very controversial what i'm going to say we know that there could be you know tomorrow there could be an rc in in different parts of the country but who knows there might not be also you never know but because of the fear that crosses in our mind at the moment we cannot think of any situation with an open mind anymore right we are always thinking in terms of already something that has happened right so i would say sense of exclusion has created a hegemonic uh, sorry sorry a homogeneous identity 
and also a sense of fear has contributed to that formation as well okay uh, there is another question on your cafe dissensus journal so uh, what are the objectives of the magazine and how many issues have already been published okay it's a long story uh, again i don't know if we have the time to do that but in brief i'll just say when we started you know uh, it was started in 2013 uh, i started it with along with my ex wife uh, though she still remains one of the editors along with me one of the founding editors in 2012 i had published an article on a muslim violent incident that happened in mumbai i was in new york at the time so i published in 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 uh, a website called news laundry many of us know it news laundry had launched at that time just then you know i think they launched in 2012 i wrote an article and when the article was published on the website finally i saw they have done a lot of editing to make it appear very secular and liberal you know so some of the things that i said some of the controversial things that i said uh, because i was trying to defend uh, these muslims not the violence but these uh, muslims in mumbai uh, they didn't want that so they wanted a more sanitized version so it struck me that maybe you know uh, maybe we need a space where we can speak the way we want to speak because at that time we didn't have many online portals in india you know if you see at that time we had only kafila was one of the online spaces i remember uh, and then the newspapers had limited online presence you know even open magazine had just launched at the time uh, caravan had its on the limited online space because they were not very much online at the time that was 7 years ago then uh, then we we thought that let's do it and how do we do it we thought we will choose a topic a theme issue for each issue so initially we are doing a lot of issues like first year writing we had 10 issues or something now it has come down to four or something because i am extremely busy and i am mostly editing now uh, uh, i am mostly doing it now i don't have that kind of time because i have, you know so much time goes into my research and writing so first issue i remember we did on indian muslim you know indian muslims and the way forward because of that bombay incident that happened in 2012 we wanted to get the idea that what are the muslims thinking exactly because i was thinking till that time mostly who are writing on muslims not muslims themselves you know this is a very new phenomenon who are writing about Kash kashmiris not kashmiris themselves it's mostly non kashmiri hindus who are writing about kashmiris it's mostly hindus who are writing about muslims till then at that time the way the picture was you know this is a very recent phenomenon and i would say because of alternative media sites like us and many others that muslims have started two circle dot net for that matter it was there it had launched around that time because of these sites now we get to see these alternative views of muslims themselves what dalits are thinking what tribals are thinking but back in 2013 when we were trying to launch it we didn't have that kind of a platform so that was the idea behind it yeah and i would i would request in fact you know uh, i don't see many bengali muslims writing for us whereas i publish many muslims or many others from other communities and other states i would say bengali muslims are the least contributor they are not writing they should be writing more so dr khan there are lots of uh, questions so it is not possible to answer all this question so uh, i would ask the, the last question that uh, selim sex is asking uh, will it uh, it help indian muslim if they start to consider their identity to live peaceful life what what could you please repeat the question once more yes uh, will it uh, help indian muslim if they start to consider their identity to live peaceful life i would not say concealing see this is what i always say because i have a lot of debates on this very issue with a lot of people see when i let's say when i enter the classroom am i concealing my identity when i go to my classroom in jindal the students already know from my name i am a muslim i am not concealing anything when someone asks me my name in the fly you know at the airport they know i am a muslim so what is there to conceal this is exactly what i 
there is a difference between concealing and being assertive what i am saying is assertion could be problematic because assertion also produces a kind of homogenization by that what i mean muslim means everyone has to wear hijab muslim means everyone has to eat biryani muslim means everyone has to speak just urdu you know muslim means everyone has to pray five times a day this is precisely what i have problems with because the moment we create that we are excluding some people from that in group and i have seen this more among muslims than any other community no hindu ask another hindu did you go to the temple no christian ask another christian did you go to the church no you know jew will ask another jew did you go to the synagogue why didn't you go a muslim will ask another muslim why didn't you come for the friday prayer i mean what i mean what i am trying to say by this is identity is fine you know we are such that even without saying a word my identity as a muslim is already known to everyone and everyone knows it already now comes the question of politics on the basis of identity i think that's a very dangerous game and we have seen the result of what's happening you know because identity as identity is not problematic as such i have seen many hindus hindu bengalis or hindus in india they would they celebrate our identity you know they do when it comes to food and other practices they do celebrate our identity but when it comes to politics with that identity what we are talking about political islam before i don't know it's a it's it's like playing with fire basically so yes uh yes uh, we came to the last moment so <clears throat> uh, so i uh, extend my sincere gratitude uh, to dr khan for this wonderful and insightful and engaging conversation uh, i would like to thank uh, base for uh, for providing me uh, us actually this hopes uh, and again uh, i would like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to all the audience and all the base member uh, they are the main part of the program so thank you all okay so i would like to also thank everyone for their patience and uh, thank uh, base and dr abu saleh and mr dhabak i should thank you and because since there are so many comments and questions i would also appreciate if you could guys just simply forward me these comments if it's possible at all for you okay because otherwise once we end the session i might miss the questions i just wanted to have have a look at those questions and if you have any more questions i would suggest all of you please write to me you know i i would respond to your emails or message me so that we can take the conversation forward okay thank you very much so you can send uh, uh, the all these questions to base uh, email id so uh, from uh, from there we can send or forward to dr khan okay thank you very much okay thank you so much bye bye take care